For centuries, Christians have been known as men and women of prayer, people who lift up their cares and concerns to the Father in heaven. Why is that? Why do we pray? We pray because it aligns the mind of the Christian with the will of Christ. We pray because Jesus commanded us to pray at all times, in all places. We pray because the God who knows all and sees all, hears all. We pray because it is the blessed link between human weakness and divine omnipotence. We pray, not because it is some religious rule, but because the Lord is God. We pray because it is the most simple and practical way to say, I am not God. We pray, not because it is a burden to us, but because it liberates us from all other burdens. We pray, because it is exactly what the devil does not want us to do. We pray, because God can do more in five seconds than we can do in five years. We pray because it is the one thing that supersedes everything else on our to-do list today. We pray because we are too busy not to pray. We pray because somewhere, sometime, someone prayed for us. And we pray because the greatest tragedy of the Christian life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. Prayer is powerful. That's why we pray. So this entire month, we have been talking about prayer. We've been talking about this idea of prayer, and uh, we've been diving pretty deep, and we've been asking some pretty heavy questions as it relates to prayer and what prayer looks like and how we pray and our own personal prayer lives. And so we started this three weeks ago, and we simply looked at this idea of why do we pray? And the conclusion that we came to is we pray because prayer is relational. And at its core, prayer is less transactional. It's less of asking God for something and then God responding in a, a way, giving it to us or not giving it to us. It's less transactional. And it was created to be more relational. It was created as something that would connect our heart to God's. And we said, okay, if, if prayer is more relational, if that's why we pray, then we ask the question, when should we pray? And, and we looked in the, uh, 1 Thessalonians where Paul said, pray continually. And, and we talked about how prayer is something that we do inside normal patterns and routines. We pray at certain times of the day. Maybe you have a time that you like to pray. But prayer is also something that far expands beyond our normal patterns and routines. And it's something that is, uh, that is a mindset that saturates every moment, every action, every decision, everything that we do. And so when we pray is not so much of a certain time of day, but when we pray is all the time. It's our mindset and God hears our mind and our actions and our thoughts and our feelings. It's something that is done continually. And so then we looked at this idea of, okay, so if prayer is relational, it's less transactional, it's less about sitting down and just asking for a bunch of requests, but it's more about a relationship with God and connecting our heart with His, and it's something that we do all the time, every moment of every day, then how do we do that? What does that look like? And last week, we looked at this idea of how do we practically pray? And we said, we pray inside our normal routines. There are certain times of the day that maybe you like to pray. But we also realize and we are aware that everything that we do is a prayer to God. And being aware of that changes our prayer life and changes our relationship with God. And so how we pray becomes less about stopping and doing something and more about being aware that what we are doing is a prayer. And tonight we're going to finish this series and we are going to talk about the outcome of prayer. And this is where prayer gets really, really dicey. This is where uh, prayer sometimes can be painful 
And this is where prayer can sometimes be joyous. And so tonight, we are going to talk about the outcome of prayer. How should we handle or what should be the outcome of our prayer lives? And so first things first, I want to dive right in because uh, first things first is we have to understand this. We have to understand that we have the opportunity to influence God. It's this incredible teaching throughout the Bible that if our prayer life is truly relational, then just like any other relationship that we have in our lives, God influences us and we have the opportunity to influence God. That's this incredible, incredible thing. And I think so often we get in this pattern and this routine of saying, all right, God already knows everything. God already knows what I'm dealing with. God already knows what's going to happen in the future. God already knows. God already has everything planned out. And so I'm going to go ahead and pray. But really, like my prayer is not like changing God in any way. It's not influencing him. I'm just praying. But the Bible teaches specifically that when we pray, it is just like any other relationship. And we have the opportunity to influence God. We see this throughout the entire Bible. Throughout the Old Testament, there are accounts of people praying to God. And God had one plan. He was going one direction with the things that he was going to do. And people prayed to God. And God was like, you know what? All right. We'll, we'll call an audible. We'll switch things up. We'll do this differently instead. And I think so often we forget that, that we have this opportunity to influence God. Now, now hear me clearly. God is God. We are never going to influence God to be something that he is not. We are never going to influence God to be uh, something that goes against his very nature. But God is in a relationship with us. And we have the opportunity to influence him inside that incredible, loving, awesome relationship. Jesus talks about this right after he teaches people how to pray. We looked last week at the Lord's Supper and Jesus, or not the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Prayer, and how Jesus taught the people to pray. And Jesus goes right into more things about prayer. And a few verses after the Lord's Prayer, he says this in Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13. He says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God wants us to express ourselves to him. And I thought it was interesting that Luke here uses this word Holy Spirit. And so like the Holy Spirit is one of those words that like we use a lot in church and a lot of times we don't really explain what it is. And so I'm just going to give you a real, real simple baseline definition. The Holy Spirit is just God living inside you. And so you, you think about that. God living inside you. He's with you constantly, helping you continuously. He's a part of who you are and what you do. And so Jesus says, listen, your life is influenced by God, and yet you have the opportunity as you live to make requests, to ask things, to pour out your heart to God, and for God to say, all right, I'm, I'm giving you my spirit uh, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some good things. I'm going to direct you. Uh, I'm going to help you through some, some difficult times. God loves to give us good things. And that's evident because he's with us all the time. Like he gave us himself. God loves to give us good things. But I think a lot of times we end up missing the gifts of God, we end up missing the way that we have influenced God and the way that God has been like, yeah, all right, I'll give that to you. And I think we miss it often because we assume that some of those things, some of those gifts that God gives us 
are just coincidences. Let me give you an example. All right, we're moving into the fall. Kirsten comes to me and says, CJ, Clark is, Clark, she's usually here. She's not here tonight. She is a manager for the high school girls soccer team. And so she's a ball girl on the sidelines at the home games. So we have been attending a lot of soccer games. And Kirsten came to me and she said, CJ, I really want some Northview gear. Like, we don't have any Northview gear. We have like some maroon colors just a little bit. And we try to wear those where, when we can, but I really want some Northview gear. And so she kind of mentioned this offhanded. Um, and, and I was like, okay, that's, that's cool. And so um, she didn't know this, but I went and I bought her a Northview sweatshirt through like the soccer team and all that stuff. And it, it took a few months for that to come in. But she had mentioned it a few more times before that sweatshirt came in about how she really wanted some Northview gears. Like she wanted to be able to go to the school and wear a shirt that said Northview on it. And it just so happened that I was doing security one night and the sewing ministry, which is a group of people that makes diapers and sends them all over the world, um, was, was parked outside. They had just gotten a donation from the food pantry. And it just so happens that the donation from the food pantry was a bunch of brand new Northview shirts that were misprinted. Like the, they didn't misspell anything, but just like some of the lettering and the shading didn't line up and it's just kind of off a little bit. And so I just so happened to be walking across the parking lot as the sewing ministry ladies are unpacking their cars. And they call me and my kids were with me. They call me and the kids over, they're like, hey, we got all these shirts, like an entire box full of shirts. Do you want any of them? And we were like, yes, we do want some of those. And so we dug through and got sizes and, and, uh, and we brought them home. We we're like, look at this. That very same weekend, the shirts from the soccer team came in. And so in one weekend, Kirsten went from wanting Northview gear to having sweatshirts, a long sleeve t-shirt, and a short sleeve t-shirt. And it's one of those things that like could be very easily overlooked. It could be one of those things where like, oh, that's cool. I wanted some of that. But when we start to view our prayer life differently, when we start to say, okay, everything I do is a prayer. God cares about what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling about my actions. And, and when we start to say, okay, Kirsten talking to CJ about wanting Northview gear, like Kirsten didn't sit down and be like, God, I really want some Northview gear, right? She didn't do that, but she just kind of talked to me and was like, hey, I want some Northview gear. And, and here's what I'm convinced of. When we have those conversations, God hears that. And I think God loves to just kind of drop little things in our laps like that. And if you will begin to pay attention, you will begin to see God just be like, Boop. there you go. Hey, you know what? I know you needed this today. There you go. You know what? I, I, I heard you. There you go. And it's this incredible thing where we see that we are influencing the way God works in our lives. I cannot tell you the amount of times that God has come through for our family and provided for us. All kinds of ways. And if we begin to pay attention, we will see that over and over and over and over again. When we think about the outcome of prayer, we have to acknowledge this incredible truth. We're in a relationship with God. Relationships don't go one way. It's a two-way street. God influences us and we influence God as well. Second thing, second, we have to acknowledge that while we can influence God, just like any other relationship, we don't control God with our prayers. Just like any other relationship, we don't control God with our prayers. Just because God, just because we ask God for something doesn't mean he's going to give it to us. 
See, solid relationships are based on the opportunity for you to ask for something and the opportunity for you to set up some boundaries and be like, you know what? Not right now. I, have you ever had one of those relationships where someone just demanded a favor of you? Anybody ever had one of those? Where they're like, you didn't really have an option, but someone was just like, you're gonna do this for me. I, I remember I had a, a friend in college and um, this friend had TV, but not TV that had, at that time it was cable, uh, there was no streaming back then, but he couldn't watch one of his favorite shows. And it just so happened that in my dorm room, we had the cable that would allow him to watch his favorite show. And so one night he came over and he was like, hey, can I watch this show? And I was like, sure, absolutely, go ahead and watch this show. Not a big deal. I wasn't a fan of the show, um, but, but I was like, yeah, go ahead and watch the show. Well, that turned into every single week he would come over and expect to watch the show. And not just expect to watch the show, but he would come over and it didn't matter if I had people over in my dorm room, we were hanging out and doing something. He was gonna shut down what we were doing, turn on my TV and watch his show. It didn't matter if I needed to study or write a paper. He was going to interrupt, walk in, be like, dude, it's the night that the show was on. Like, you're gonna let me watch this show. And there was no, no opportunity for me to say, you know what, not tonight. Um, he was just like, I need this, you're gonna give it to me. And it was a relationship killer. And it really harmed our friendship. And when we think about the outcome of prayer, we have to realize that genuine, healthy relationships don't control one another. Just because we pray about something doesn't mean that that something is absolutely going to happen. Many of you know that Kirsten has had something going on with her heart for like a year now. And it's been frustrating and difficult and she has been, uh, had to rest like crazy and she's missed out on things and we've prayed that she would get better and it's just kind of not happening nearly as quickly as we want to and we have to take a step back and realize that just because we pray we cannot assume that well i'm going to god so hey this is going to happen because while there is power in prayer we don't control god through our prayers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul shares this incredible story. And Paul is getting really, really vulnerable at this point in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says this, you don't have that. I must not have put that in there. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it says, I pleaded with the Lord three times to leave me alone. And he said, my grace is enough for you because my power is made perfect in weakness. This is an incredible insight into the vulnerability of who Paul was. Like you've got Paul, this guy that turned his entire life around, this guy that was persecuting Christians and now he became a guy that followed Jesus wholeheartedly, started all these churches, and he was just going, going full blown. He was all in for Jesus Christ. But there was this thing that bothered him. And, and he refers to it as a thorn in the flesh. And we don't know what that was. Um, some people think that it was a physical disability. Some people think that it was possibly a mental illness. Some people think that it was possibly a, a debilitating disease. But whatever it was, Paul was pleading with Jesus, pleading, please take this thing away from me. Like, I don't want it to be a part of my life. I want it gone. I want it out of my life. And he was pleading with God. And God has this incredible answer for Paul. He says, my grace is enough for you. 
And I think a lot of times when we think about the outcome of prayer, we have to understand that we don't control God, but we can ask God. And in the midst of those moments where we don't necessarily get the answers that we want, God's not bowing out and backing away and saying, you're on your own. God is saying, I'm going to love you in the midst of this time. I know this is hard. I know this is tough. I know this isn't fair. Bad things happen and they suck and it's just awful. And even though it's not going to change, I'm with you. My Holy Spirit is with you. I'm going to love you and support you and be with you during this difficult, difficult time. Now, I've, I've got to address something because I think this is where prayer gets dicey. I think a lot of times there is a message that is presented that is just a complete outright lie. And that's this. I think a lot of times it is said, if you're not getting what you're praying for, then you're not praying hard enough or your faith is not strong enough or you've done something wrong to deserve this. There are all, all kinds of things <clears throat> that people say. They say, they say that, that you're not good enough. They say that <clears throat> you're not worthy of, the God, of God's prayer, that, that you've just got to believe a little bit more, that you've just got to have a little more faith. Guys, that's a lie. That's a lie because that message says that if you have enough faith, you can control God. And the truth is, that's not the relationship we want with God. The truth is, there is absolutely nothing that you have done wrong to deserve the bad stuff that happens in your life. The truth is, there is no amount of faith that you could pray that would control God into doing what you want him to do. There is absolutely nothing wrong with your faith if you pray for something and don't get what you prayed for. There is nothing wrong with you. There is nothing wrong with the way that God loves you. God doesn't love you any less than anybody else because you're not getting what you prayed for. The truth is, God loves you. God cares for you. God wants to hear your heart and your prayers. And even when we don't get what we pray for, God says, this is awful. This is not fair. And I'm with you in the midst of whatever you're going through. And I am not choosing to leave you on your own. I am choosing to get into the mess with you and love you in the midst of whatever you are facing. That's the truth. There's nothing wrong with you and there's nothing wrong with your faith. God is just choosing to love you in the midst of difficult times. Bad things sometimes happen. And God says, I'm with you and I'm going to love you in the midst of those. Think for a moment about the strongest relationships that you have in your life. Maybe it's your parents, maybe it's your best friend, maybe it's your siblings, but, but picture that relationship right now in your mind. Here's my guess. My guess is that that relationship has a few things that are just definitely a part of it. And here they are. You both have influence over one another. My guess is that that person has influenced you and you can say, oh yeah, here's the ways that I'm different because of this person. And my guess is that you have also influenced that person. Second thing, neither of you controls the other person. My guess is that the best relationships in your life are not controlling relationships. Those are, are relationship killers when control starts to come into play. Neither one of you controls the other. You celebrate with one another in the good times and you love and support one another in the difficult times. 
Now listen, this describes the best relationships you have on earth. This also describes your relationship with God. You both have influence over one another. God influences you and you can influence him. Neither one of you controls the other. God allows you to make your own decisions for your life. And we don't control God through our prayers. And God wants to celebrate with you in the good times, and he wants to love you through the difficult times. The outcome of prayer is this incredible thing. The outcome of prayer is this incredible thing where we realize God does want to give us good things. And when we can start to pay attention, we'll realize those moments where God just drops things into our lives just because he's good. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to allow you to influence me to do this for you. And we can also understand as, as the outcome of prayer that while we don't control God through our prayers, there's nothing wrong with us if we don't get what we prayed for. God is just loving us in the midst of bad things that happen because we are a part of this earth. And he's getting in the mess with us and he's loving us in the midst of it. And so my practical challenge for you this week is this. If, if you've got some things that you are thinking, man, what a coincidence, this is awesome. Begin to recognize Instead of it being a coincidence, this is God. This is God giving you good things. And begin to pay attention to those moments. Begin to pay attention to those moments where a relational prayer life turned into God recognizing what you wanted and giving it to you. And if you're facing difficult times, remind yourself that God is not backing away from you. God is stepping forward and he's loving you deeply in the midst of those times. That there's nothing wrong with you, that you've done nothing to deserve what's happening to you, that it's just a tough time that is happening. And God is there loving you in the midst of it. So this week, begin to pay attention to those little moments and begin to recognize that even when times get tough, God is there loving you. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much for tonight. And uh, God, I thank you for um, prayer.